the, uh, I will have, make it available. I'll probably uh, just send out uh, a link through uh, JPI's eblast, e so that way everybody can download it directly from there. Okay. If you're not on the email blast, just go to johnsonsjpiphoto.com, and you can sign up there. Okay. And I'll type in the link in the message and the message thing here to everyone, so you'll be able to see that. But uh, but yeah, you just want to go to jpiphoto.com. Sign up on the email list for that, and I'll be glad to uh, uh, send you the message for that as well, too. I'll be sending it to everybody who signs up for the class schedules. Uh, let's see what else. I can't thank you all enough for, for showing your support today, for coming here. Uh, I can't thank Tamron enough for, for doing this, and Armando and Jeff for also helping out with all this stuff. This is going to be, hopefully, well, not well, hopefully, it will be a, a great presentation. As I said, we'll probably have some glitches along the way, so... Just have some patience with us and we'll get there. If there's anything that you guys have questions about, as I said, you should have an option where you can raise your hand and then I'll unmute you. And then you can talk and you can ask the question or put the question in the chat directly to me and direct message to me. And that way I'll be able to get that to uh, Armando. All right. Without further ado, unless you, unless you need to want to add something, Jeff, uh, we're ready to get rocking and rolling. No, sir. I am ready to go, but thank you. All right, Armando. All right. As they say, the show is yours. Ah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, my name is, well, first of all, <clears throat> this is going to be about freezing action. And basically, not necessarily sports, but any type of movement. Uh, so my name is Armando Flores, and I started taking pictures back in high school. I put my pennies together, bought a camera, and then I got hooked. Uh, so I decided to study photojournalism in college. And while I was attending college, I got hired by Nikon. Um, and uh, I spent my next 22 years there working in the professional services department. So for 17 of those years, my favorite type of photography, uh, photography was actually sports photography. So if you uh, can name it, I probably shot it. So I did have the uh, opportunity to attend, um, you know, a championship uh, baseball games and basketball games. I attended two Super Bowls, went to the uh, Olympics, photographed there. So you name it, I probably had a chance to do it. Uh, boxing in Las Vegas for 17 years. So if you saw one of those uh, boxing matches from 1988 to about 2007, I probably shot it. But uh, anyway, um, manual mode. Yes, the professionals uh, all use manual and um, there's a lot to consider when you're shooting manual, especially uh, when you're photographing fast action uh, because you have to contend with the three factors that are involved with exposure. And as you know, they are your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. And when you make a change to one of these three variables, you must make a change to one of the other two or both in the opposite direction. And that's where it gets a little bit complicated uh, because you're trying to take a picture of something that's going to happen in a split second, a fraction of a second, and you don't have time to uh, sit there and make all of your calculations. And the calculations are going to be, uh, you know, those that involve the actual exposure. And um, let's see, where did I put it? Okay, well. Anyway, it's not there, but uh, I shot an image and my settings on that image were a one over 300th of a second, so a one 300th of a second. Uh, the um, shutter speed was, again, one uh, 300th of a second. The aperture was F9 and my ISO was 100. So the shutter speed was not fast enough to freeze the movement, so I had to increase my shutter speed to a thousandth of a second. Um, and then... Uh, my lens had a teleconverter uh, mounted on it, which cut the light from coming through the lens by one stop. I had a 70 to 200, which now uh, made it into a, a, a 105 to 280 at F4. And my ISO, once again, was 100. So you have to sit there and calculate all those uh, movements. So if I change my uh, shutter speed to 1,000, that means that I've got to change my aperture by, by my exposure complete exposure by one and 
two thirds of a stop. Whether I change my ISO or my aperture, that is up to me. If I change my aperture, then I'm going to diminish my depth of field. So you see how this is getting crazy and complicated as I'm rambling on. Hey, Armando. Yes. I, I got a question from Chris yes. Dillinger. He says, when I have to shoot, I need to use the auto ISO since college. Uh, Jim has poor lighting for volleyball and basketball. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll get to that setting in, a, in, a, in a, a few slides. But yes, absolutely. I do recommend that. Right. So what we're going to talk about uh, is understanding shutter speed and what it actually is and what it does. And then we're going to give you some starting points of shutter speeds for a certain type of uh, moving subject. Uh, camera settings that you should utilize, and that's where auto ISO comes in. And then solving a problem. If you get into a situation like I have many times, how do you solve it? And of course, it, it is a lot of practice in order for you to uh, get better at it, you do have to do it a lot and constantly. So let's go ahead and get started with understanding shutter speed. And it's actually very simple. Shutter speed is simply the amount of time that you are allowing the light that comes through the lens to hit your exposure or to, you know, to expose onto the uh, camera's imaging sensor. That's simply all it does. But what you're actually doing is that you are actually controlling motion. You are actually showing uh, a subject uh, either frozen or blurry, depending on what shutter speed you, you selected. Now, this is the image I was talking about. I was in San Diego at the Red Bull Air Races, and I took this picture as a teaching tool. So I set my shutter speed uh, once again at a 1 3 20th of a second. Uh, I set my aperture at f9 with the iso of 100 because that is what gave me the exposure that i needed uh, once again this lens did have a teleconverter on it which does magnify the lens but reduces the amount of light coming through the lens as well so i had to make the changes on the you know on the fly but you know in order for me to concentrate on my image what i do is uh, i set up a semi-automated mode and I'll tell you what you know what that is or how that is in a second but in order for us to take a photograph of a moving subject we have to use the correct shutter speed okay so these are the starting points always the faster the shutter speed the better your chances are going to be to freeze that motion so for example if your subject is motionless they're not moving and you are hand holding the camera uh, your shutter speed can be, you know, between a 60th and a 125th of a second because most of us can physically handhold a camera at those shutter speeds, okay? If your subject is walking or moving around a little bit, your shutter speed needs to increase by a little bit too, a 125th to a 250th. Your subject is now jogging, running in place, and you want to freeze that movement between a 250 and a 500. Now they're running. As you can see, the faster the subject moves, the faster your shutter speed needs to be in order for you to freeze that movement. Uh, now you do need to practice this and figure out yourself uh, what shutter speed you need for your particular subject matter. But let's say for example, you are uh, at a baseball game and you are uh, concentrating uh, your efforts on the pitcher. You want to get the ball as he releases it uh, from his uh, fingers, but you want to freeze the stitches on the ball. Guess what? You're going to need somewhere at a, uh, of a shutter speed around a four thousandth of a second. So, the camera mode that I choose to use 70% of the time uh, when I'm shooting moving subjects is uh, the S mode on your camera dial. Uh, for those of you that have Canon, that is TV, time value. Uh, the S on everyone else's, all the other manufacturer's camera is shutter priority. What this allows me to do is set my shutter speed at whatever I want. The camera then will set the aperture for me. I still have control over any, everything else, however. So basically, if I know I need about a thousandth of a second uh, to freeze that movement, then I go ahead and just simply dial it in. The camera sets the aperture for me, but I'm always looking at my settings. I'm always looking at the, that aperture to make sure that it, I have enough depth of field. Now, sometimes if your exposure is off, you'll get that aperture in the viewfinder blinking. What the camera is telling you is that it's gone beyond the range of the maximum aperture of that lens. 
In other words, it cannot open the lens up anymore. It's giving you a warning by flashing, and now you're going to have to do something else. Now you're going to have to manipulate your ISO. You're going to have to raise it in order for you to be able to get that shutter speed that you're looking for. Okay, so shutter priority, what it allows me to do, it allows me to go from a fast moving subject and freeze that uh, moment in peak action uh, to the next shot just simply slowing down my shutter speed to add a little bit of drama or uh, dimension to the image. This particular case, we're photographing uh, models uh, in wedding gowns and um, there was, I took a few pictures and the image was a little static. So I asked the model to simply twirl the umbrella in her fingers, uh, giving me that little bit of blur behind her. So it made the image a little more dramatic. Uh, so with, with a manual mode setting, you're going to have to concentrate on the three other factors. So again, shutter priority just makes things a little more easy. Now, that is where your auto ISO comes in. If you are shooting in a semi-automated mode, okay, uh, shutter priority for sports, uh, your camera sets the aperture for you. You then have control over all of the other settings. If you select auto ISO, now the camera is going to take control of that ISO as well. So you're not going to get the little aperture uh, symbol blinking because the camera can now go into the ISO settings and uh, go ahead and it can go ahead and control those. However, my recommendation is to set the parameters for auto ISO. And what I mean by that is that in auto ISO, you can tell the camera never go above this ISO number. So uh, you can tell the camera, you know, don't go above 800 if you're in bright sunlight uh, or if your camera, if you know that your camera is a bit noisy uh, at a certain ISO level, you can tell the camera not to go above that ISO number. The other parameter you can set on your camera is the shutter speed, the, the slowest shutter speed that the camera can set. So you can also tell the camera, okay, don't go above this ISO, but don't drop below the shutter speed as well. So for a lot of shooting situations uh, in an environment where you have the light changing, You've got a very overcast sky, clouds are coming in and out, or you're going from a bright uh, part of the uh, scene or the stadium to a darker part, uh, auto ISO works quite well. Another camera setting that you want to select is autofocus, continuous autofocus in this case. Uh, as the subject moves across the scene, what happens is that their distance is changing in relation to the camera. Uh, so as they get closer, uh, the camera needs to continue to focus on the subject so that when you press the button, your subject is still nice and sharp. There are also a few autofocus mode settings that you can select from in your camera. So for example, most cameras have a wide area autofocus mode. What that mode actually does, and this is pretty standard when you go into a complete automatic, the camera will go into a wide area autofocus and it's going to focus on the closest thing to the lens, which may not necessarily be your subject. So it is better to change that mode to something that you can actually have a little more control over. Uh, one of those being a, a group autofocus or a zone autofocus. Um, now, again, depending on the camera, they call it one or the other, or they may call it something else. But basically what it is, the camera batches a group of autofocus points, whether they would, they're to the right, to the center, or to the left of the screen, or sometimes the top or the bottom. And it will only utilize those focus points to capture uh, your subject. So this is very useful when you are photographing a subject that's making a repetitive motion or movement. Uh, you're photographing a auto race and the car are coming around a corner. You just simply want to catch them as they come around a corner. You select the group of autofocus points that uh, best suits your needs or your framing 
and go with that. For most other sports or actions, you may want to use a single autofocus point. So what you're doing is you're selecting one autofocus point out of all the uh, focusing sensors inside your camera and telling the camera, use this focus point only and focus on my subject. Uh, that's very good when you wanna pinpoint a subject. You've got uh, a group of three or four people in an event. Uh, let's say you are at a uh, 100 meter race you want to photograph your particular subject regardless of what position they come in single autofocus point is great for that particular uh, situation so another mode that you may uh, that you want to use on your camera is continuous shooting as well now what continuous shooting does is that it takes the camera and it takes as many pictures as it possibly can as quickly as it can. Now, this is going to vary from one camera model to the other and from one manufacturer to the other. Uh, most entry-level cameras have a firing rate of about two to three frames per second. So for most motion or for most uh, sports, it's really not quite fast enough. Uh, once you move up into a little more advanced camera model, uh, the frame rate starts going up and obviously so does the price. However, now you're getting cameras that will fire at five to seven frames per second. And for me, uh, in my opinion, this is where we, we want to start. We want a camera that gives us at least six frames per second because it's going to give us more choices, uh, more uh, focus points, more peak action choices uh, from your subject. So let's run through these really quick and see what six frames per second looks like. Okay, let's put that in reverse. Okay, once again, real fast. There you go, that's six frames per second. Can you imagine if I had back then, uh, this was shot with a Nikon and a 28 to 300 and all in one lens. I was in Venice Beach, I was walking around, wasn't sure what I was gonna capture, but I wanted a lens that, that gave me a pretty nice range of everything. So um, I went ahead and uh, set up the camera and I pre-focused in this case, focus on the uh, gentleman here uh, squatting because I knew that's where the subject was going to go over. I set my camera to continuous shooting, uh, in this case, six frames per second. And as I saw him approaching, I had both eyes open, one through the viewfinder and then the other one seen as he approached the point of uh, where he was going to uh, leap. And then I went ahead and pressed the button and I was able to, you know, capture um, six frames. So can you imagine if I had a camera back then, one of the ones that, I, that are available now, you, you have cameras that'll do 10 frames per second and you have some cameras that will go up to 20 frames per second. I would have had 20 choices of which was the best uh, point that, you know, in that scene that I wanted to select and, you know, do something with. Okay, so the other factor, uh, once again, is the ISO. That is the one thing that I always choose to set or change last. I will play with my shutter speed as much as I can. I will play with the aperture as much as I can. And then at the very last resort, I will change my ISO. The reason I choose that last is because I always want to use the lowest ISO possible. To get me the to give me the most detail in my image because the higher the ISO goes, the more noise you're going to incorporate into your shot. Uh, if you remember back in the film days, that was grain. Now it's called noise. Uh, some cameras do very well up to a certain level of ISO, and then beyond that, they just get too noisy. So, what I always do is. Um, you know, I, I go out and I do an ISO test on the cameras that uh, I, I get, brand new camera, receive it, boom, go out and do an ISO test. And what I do is I set up my camera on a tripod and I take pictures. I make sure that my scene has a, uh, you know, a bright area, a mid-tone and a shadow area. That's where you're going to see the noise in the shadow area. Set it up on a tripod. And then what I do is uh, each uh, you know, sequential shot, I will raise my ISO. 
uh, I'll start at about 800 because most cameras will do a great job up to 800. And then I will increase my ISO, doubling the number uh, each shot until I get to the very limit of the camera. Now, if you bring those images onto a computer screen, re you really don't get the feel of how my, much noise you're actually uh, seeing. So I actually go out and actually make some prints because you will see it on a print a lot easier and a lot better. So what I do is I will go ahead and write the ISO number on a piece of paper and put it in the frame so I know what ISO I shot it at. I don't have to take notes and I don't have to refer back to my metadata. It makes it a lot easier. Make the prints and then pick out that one print that you find that is way too noisy uh, for your taste. Uh, and uh, that is your tolerance for noise because your tolerance for noise and mine are going to be probably a, a little bit different. So went out with this camera, uh, the, that's the D750 Nikon, and I did my ISO test and I found that my ISO, uh, my noise level was at 3200. I would not ever use this camera above that unless I absolutely, absolutely needed to. But um, anyway, that is very helpful when you do that auto ISO. Hey, I got another question here Armando, yes. from uh, Chris uh, Dillinger. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing learned over time, always write down your settings so I go back to the same place again and have it written down and will help you know how to set the camera ahead of time. So if need to do a basic change, you say. Yes, that is correct if it's the same exact place with the same exact lighting conditions. Uh, if you go one day at two o'clock and another day at four o'clock, the lighting is going to be a little bit different. So you right. can have a starting point. You can set that as your starting point and then tweak it from there. Sure. Yeah. But just keep that in mind that it may not be exactly the same. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So auto ISO, once again, is actually very helpful uh, for when you're photographing a scene and your subject is transitioning from a dark area to a lighter area. All you have to do is concentrate on what type of image you want to capture. In this case, I wanted to capture a little bit of movement uh, at the runner's feet and I wanted to uh, freeze the rest of, you know, their torso. So, you know, at about a one sixtieth uh, of a second, I was able to do that. Which brings us to solving a problem. Okay, so a few years back, I'm in Denver, Colorado and I'm doing a birding event. They had some uh, birds that they were actually going to allow to fly from one point to the other. I had with me three trunks full of lenses and uh, we had quite a few participants. What happened is I loaned out every lens that I had with me with the exception of a um, um, 180 f 3.5 Tamron macro lens. Okay, this lens is over 10 years in its design. Uh, so it does not, it did not, it's no, no longer in our, in, in our lineup. Uh, it did not focus very fast, but that's all I had. So I take the lens, mount it on the camera, go out to where they're going to be, um, you know, uh, shooting and the bird does one pass. And I followed the, the bird when it got to the point where I want to take a picture, I pressed the button, fired off three or four frames. Every single one of those was blurry because it just simply couldn't focus fast enough. So what I did at that point is that I, I made a determination, said, okay, I want to capture this bird nice and sharp. So I made a uh, mental note as to what flight path it took. I focused somewhere within that flight path. I made sure that my shutter speed was fast enough. So I figure about a 500th of a second would do it. I then set my aperture to F11 so that I would uh, ensure myself enough depth of field so that if it missed a, that flight path just by a little bit, I would still be nice and sharp. And uh, in order for me to get that combination of aperture and shutter speed, I had to set my ISO to 800th of a, uh, uh, an ISO 800. So the bird does another pass and I follow it. I, I you know, just uh, by pointing the camera in that direction, I follow it and then I press the button once it got to that point where I actually pre-focused and wanted to take the picture. Fired off a series, a series of five or six frames, I forget, and four of them were tack sharp. 
So that's how you solve a focusing problem if you uh, run into one. Um, your subject is simply moving too fast. The action's uh, happening way too quickly. You're not getting enough uh, shots off because your uh, drive speed is not fast enough or your camera isn't focusing fast enough. Uh, focusing speed is determined, uh, A, by the motor inside that lens, but primarily by the autofocus sensors in your camera. They are the ones that really determine how fast they can focus and how accurately, accurately they can focus because not all autofocus systems are created equal. Some cameras have, uh, back in the day, they had nine autofocus points. Now we're looking at camera that, cameras that have over 640 autofocus points. Uh, and again, not all uh, autofocus points are created equal either. Some of those autofocus points are what we call cross sensor. They have autofocus sensors going vertically and horizontally. So regardless of the orientation of the camera or, or what the uh, background or what the subject matter is, they're going to capture focus a lot easier. So very important to know how many autofocus points your camera has and most importantly, how many of those are cross types. So when you are using one single or individual autofocus point, you know that you're selecting the right one. Hey, Armando, I got a question for you. Just as yes. from me, as I was just wondering, are you doing any kind of panning when you were shooting this one or the, or even the previous one with the runners? You know, as they were was, running across, were you panning I was, the shot? I was definitely panning the shot with the runners. And with this one, I was panning, but my camera was already pre-focused. So okay. all I was doing is following to make sure that uh, when we got to that point where I was going to fire, I was able to. Okay, cool. Rather, rather than just waiting for it to get there and miss it. <laughs> okay. right. If anybody's got any questions, let me, so I'll, I'll jump in here just one quick. Uh, just make sure you can message me. Again, raise your hand or, you know, or just let me know you want to be unmuted and I'll, that way we, we can ask your question. I don't want you to feel like you, you can't ask any questions. Keep in mind, if, if Armando's got time, we'll, we'll let him uh, do some questions at the end of it. And oh, absolutely. And go along. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so I don't want you guys to feel like, you know, you, you get to just listen to us all speak. <laughs> so, so just keep that in mind, guys. All right, I'm going to mute myself again. All right. So uh, brings us to another situation. Again, same, uh, you know, air race in San Diego. Uh, we had uh, three trunks of lenses. So the lenses that were uh, borrowed or loaned out were, of course, the long telephoto lenses, 70 to 300, 100 to 400, 150 to 600, and so on and so forth. So the only lens left for me to use was the lens that I had personally taken with me because even my 150 to 600 was loaned out to somebody else. So I went out and uh, with the 70 to 200 and found that, you know what? I don't have enough reach. I just can't get the subject large enough in the viewfinder. Sure, I can take the picture, I can bring it back into my computer and then crop it uh, you know, to whatever size I want. However, when we're cropping an image post, what we're actually doing is we're throwing away data. So for example, uh, this subject uh, filled 25% uh, of the frame. And if I wanted to blow this up full frame or to fill the screen, I would have to throw away 75% of my data. Well, I was shooting with a 24 megapixel camera. So if I throw away 75% of my data, I'm left with 6 million pixels. Is that a bad thing? Well, it really depends on what you want to do with that file after the fact. And sometimes we don't know what we might do with that image one year or two years from now. So what I always like to do is I like to future proof my images uh, because I don't know what's going to happen, you know, uh, down the line. So that's why I try to fill the frame as much as possible, uh, you know, uh, when I take the picture. And the reason is if I'm going to do a presentation, uh, you know, for you on a high definition TV, then uh, those TVs have resolution of 1920 by 1080. If we multiply those two numbers, we get 2.2 million. So that tells you that I only need about 2 million pixels to show you an image on a high def TV. However, technology moves on and we now have 4K TVs. 4K TVs have four times the resolution. So guess what? Now I need 4 million pixels, excuse me, 8 million pixels to give you a nice image on that screen. So 
uh, 8K TVs came out last year. So guess what? Now you're going to need 32 million pixels to show a nice image on those TVs. So that, that gives you an example of, uh, you know, what happens when you crop an image. Uh, the other thing that you can do is that you can actually use um, a teleconverter or a, or a tele extender. Now, a teleconverter is actually a lens. It does have glass in it, uh, and it's a lens that you mount in between the camera and the lens that you're using. This uh, teleconverter was a 1.4x, so it multiplies or magnifies your image by 1.4 times. Okay, so if I mount that converter on that 70 to 200, it gave me a uh, magnification of 280 millimeters. All right, so there is uh, something else that I also like to use, and that is the camera that I actually use to take images and photograph with. I have another camera now. Uh, it's the Nikon D500. And the D500 is a crop sensor camera that gives me 10 frames per second. So that is usually my choice when I go out and shoot, uh, you know, any type of moving subject because uh, I now have a camera that does 10 frames per second rather than my 750 that only gives me six. That camera has a crop sensor. That sensor is smaller than a full frame sensor. So it actually magnifies. You're viewing a cropped in section of that, of that large size sensor. And it magnifies on an icon by 1.5. So the crop factor is 1.5 on a Nikon, a Fuji, a Sony, a Pentax, a Leica. Now, Canon also has a crop sensor camera. It's also an APS-C size sensor, but the crop factor is 1.6. Okay, so if you mount a teleconverter on a crop sensor camera, then you are already shooting on a 70 to 200, for example, you are shooting a 300 millimeter lens at, um, with a 1.4 converter, now you're looking at a 420 millimeter lens. Now you can see where that actually be, uh, becomes, uh, you know, an advantage. Now both cameras have 24 million pixels, so they're both they both have the same resolution. So I like to do that uh, when I'm shooting sports, and I may be undergunned with my telephoto lens. Okay, which brings us to panning. Oh, I got another question about the teleconverter. Yes. Uh, this is from Chris again. Uh, Chris is asking, when you use the teleconverter, do you notice any slowness from it? I get on my uh, Nikon Z6 Gen 1, uh, Generation 1, I'm assuming Tamron, uh, 70 to 200 with, a, it's, he says 11.7 teleconverter. I'm not sure what that uh, one, it's it's a 1.7 uh, Nikon probably, yeah it's probably what he's Nikon talking about, did yeah. make an older 1.7 now the 1.7 it's much older technology so right. you'll find that that may make a difference uh, the items that I use here for these particular shots were newer a 70 to 200 2.8 G2 which is the fastest that we have with the brand new teleconverter um, I did not use the older 70 to 200 because that converter does not work with it okay but with our current generation, I find that there is no loss in autofocus speed. So and I was going to say you're talking with the current Tamron G2? Yes, okay. correct. With the current 70 to 200 G2 and the current teleconverter, no loss in autofocus speed that I noticed at all. Uh, image quality loss, you can't even really tell if there's any image quality loss. However, once you go to a uh, 2.0 converter, a two times teleconverter, I did notice a, a little bit of, well, a, a little more loss in uh, autofocus speed and a little loss in resolution. And the reason is because a teleconverter is a lens, light is now traveling further through the optical path and you do lose one stop of light with a 1.4 and two stops of light with a one uh, with a 2.0. So a six, a, 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 an F6.3 lens um, on a uh, on a camera becomes an f um, what is that uh, f eleven 
I think so. Roughly, like an F11. And a 2.0 converter becomes an F13. Right. Now, there are no autofocus camera systems out there that are able to focus accurately with that very little light coming through it. So, anyway. Sometimes uh, when we're photographing, we may want to add a little drama to our image. We want to make them a little more impactful or we want to show movement or motion. Uh, in this case, uh, the runner here is running at 10 miles an hour. Uh, the image on the top left was photographed at a thousandth of a second. As you can see, frozen in time, it looks like he's posing. However, if you want to show that they're actually moving, what you do is you select a shutter speed that is approximately four times slower then the recommended shutter speed. And again, that's a starting point. The slower, the more motion you're going to record. So what I do is I set my camera to continuous autofocus, continuous shooting. I capture my subject before it gets to the point where I actually want to uh, press the button and take the picture. I start focusing, I follow the subject, I keep it in my viewfinder in the same position, and then once it gets to the point where I want to take a picture, I fire off a series of shots. Again, really depends on how many frames I can capture with my particular camera. And, um, you know, you want to do this uh, several times. You want to try it at different shutter speeds, and what you're going to find is that no two images are going to be alike. So a uh, couple years back, I'm in uh, downtown Los Angeles. I hear that they're going to have the uh, women's marathon uh, trials for the Olympics. Uh, so I knew traffic was going to be pretty bad. I hop on my bike uh, with a backpack. I put one camera, one lens. I took the 16 to 300 all in one because it was bright out and uh, I knew this would give me all the range that I would need. So the runners come by, they're going to make a, they're going to make six passes or six loops, uh, at this particular point. And what I did is as the runners came by, I went ahead and fired off the set and they came by again, fired off the, another set at a different shutter speed. I, I shot some at an eighth of a second. The runners were moving so fast that their feet disappeared. So the shutter speed was so slow that their feet could not be recorded because they were moving too fast. So anyway, I chose this one and this was at about, a, this was at a 15th of a second. And this is going to take a little bit of practice because once again, not all uh, images are going to be alike because there's going to be a little variation between one and the other. So go ahead and, uh, you know, try this if you like. And uh, again, practice, 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 because uh, what's going to happen is that, um, you know, you have to have an idea of what you want to do beforehand. You want to have a game plan. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, get there early, uh, make sure you scout out the location, uh, look at the light, see where it's coming from, see what direction you want to shoot at, or maybe perhaps there's something interesting that you want to capture. I got there early, about uh, an hour early. They were practicing the handoff and they were having trouble. And I saw this and I go, hmm, I wonder what will happen when the race goes off. So I saw that the handoff, the trouble they were having was in the third exchange from third to the anchor. So I figure, okay, I'll position my, myself over here. I had the 70 to 300 on there. I framed my image and then I followed them around the track. And when they got to this position, I started firing off pictures. Hey, Armando, did you see that uh, Beth says to everyone, uh, her 16 to 300 Tamron lens is her favorite? <laughs> so, you know, once again, knowing getting there early, I was able to select the right equipment. I was, uh, you know, positioned in the right pl place. I made sure my exposure was correct. And as they proceeded to, you know, to go on with the race and try to hand off continuous shooting once again continuous focus and just firing off until they basically missed it oh. hey i got another question from beth with shooting athletes soccer i will uh, i will often get blur in the in a hand is that shutter speed issue aperture question question uh, question that is shutter speed itch issue. Your shutter speed is not fast enough to, to freeze the faster portion of the body. 
In other words, uh, if you want to freeze their hands in midair or mid action, your shutter speed has to be faster than what you're using now. If you're using a 250th, you have to go to 500 or maybe even a thousand because that particular part of the body is moving faster than the rest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, guys? Yeah, uh, I love the Gen 1 Tamron 150 to 600. <laughs> But I'm going to read what it says here, but it says, but sucks on the C6. <laughs> it can only shoot in manual focus, also known as full manual mode. I get no VR2, but if I need to use it, put a, I put it on my D7200. Yeah, that Gen 1 was a little slower focusing for sure. Yeah. But we definitely have improved it on the 2. Much faster focus, much better VC, and much better uh, uh, weather sealing as well. Yeah, I can attest using the 150 to 600 Gen 2. I've used that lens uh, in shooting some wildlife and nature, and I, that's been a great autofocus lens for that. And it does work on the Z6 move because as long as you've got the current firmware update, which it should be by this point with everything out there, you should be able to use it, you know, be, be like butter shooting, you know, be pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I guess, all right. No one else? Sorry, right, I'm going to put it back on mute. Well, this is actually the uh, question and answer part of the presentation. So we are actually okay. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, cool. All right, so um, when will we get one for the, the 150 to second uh, Gen 2? When will we get one for the Gen 1, 150 to 600 been on the list? I'm assuming you're asking, Chris, when will the Gen 2 be out? Gen 2 is already out. It's been out for a while. I'm assuming that's where, what you're asking. Yeah, it's been out for a couple of years now. Yeah, it's available. If you, uh, if you, in fact, um, Michael Arbor is there to uh, at the at, at Johnson Photo from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You give the store a call at 941-896-9921. Give him a call, and he'll let you know if they got it in stock or not. Uh, Peter Berkeley, uh, Berkeley says, uh, do you use back button focus much? You know, I do use it for some sports, but not all sports. Um, boxing is very good uh, for back, uh, you know, back button focus because you want to continue to focus. You're, you're uh, concentrating on one of the boxers, not both. And that way you ensure yourself that, uh, you know, they're nice and sharp. So, yes, for some instances, and, but not for all. All right. All right, Chris is messaging me here again. He says, we have lists said working on Gen 1 pending. I'm not sure. What, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming he's still referring to the Gen 1. And I think what is, I think what he's referring to is to the firmware upgrade. Oh, firmware upgrade. Okay. Yes. Uh, the firmware upgrade for the G2 is done and has been. Uh, they are looking into uh, being able to do the firmware on the Gen 1. Okay. So stay tuned. Um, hopefully okay. they will. There's a couple Gen 1 lenses that they're looking into. Okay. Does that, uh, does that answer your question, Chris? Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay, great. Anybody got any other questions out there for Armando? Yeah. You know, uh, like I said, I'm going to have this uh, – it's going to take a while for the Zoom to compile the download for the, for the video after this is all done. So when I get everything done, I'll be, I'll be able to share that through the, uh, uh, through the e-blast through, uh, for Johnson's, uh, Johnson Photo Imaging's newsletter. So I did post it a couple of times because I saw some people come in late and stuff, so like that. So uh, it should be, the link should be in the chat. But uh, if you haven't done that already, uh, it's... Um, uh, you can always go to Johnson's website and you can just subscribe to it there. Uh, if, that, yes, sir. I've got a question for Jeff Vogelai. Uh, is he out there? He should be. I think he's still here somewhere. And, uh, and the, I don't know. Right, let me see if I can find him. I think he might have uh, dropped off. Okay. Yeah, let me see. Tam. Oh, no, here he is. Ah, are there any deals going on? I don't know. Let's go to us. Let's see if I can get, let's see if he's, uh, I don't know if he's wandered away or not. <laughs> but uh i'll wait to see what he gets back on here uh now the guy question is right i have a website where he can uh, uh where we can see your work and i'm going to go sure 
Uh, yes, uh, I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, AF Tamron Tech. It's at AF Tamron Tech. Tech. T E C H? Uh, yes, T E C H. And okay. Facebook would be just my name, Armando Flores. Okay. All right. Uh, Kevin, uh, just a thought. Stay, stay, stay everyone. Just a thought on shutter priority versus manual with auto ISO. I hate to give that up. Uh, he, he's talking a difference between aperture. I mean, excuse me, manual and shutter priority. Uh, I think he's on. Uh, you're on. You're on um, your, your mic, Kevin. You can ask your question. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Dono? I can Kevin. hear you. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, what I'm what I'm trying to type is, I hate to give up the control of the aperture. That's so fine. that's why so versus shutter priority where oh, you're letting fine. aperture select yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. What you can do is you can you can set both of your parameters. You can set your shutter speed and your aperture and let, let the camera uh, control the ISO by going auto. Uh, but once again, just top it off and tell it don't go above this one because it could okay. choose twelve thousand eight hundred ISO, which on my camera looks terrible. <laughs> and, and, and on mine too. Thank you very yeah. much. Sure. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna call uh, call uh, Jeff real quick here. See if I get a hold of him and see what he says about uh, if I get it back online here. Oh, new one new message. Hang on, sorry. Have you used or played with mirrorless camera? And what's your take using mirrorless mode for sports uh, photography? Yes, and uh, I actually worked for Sony for five years before coming on to Tamron. Uh, I've been with Tamron for almost six years now. And yes, I have used mirrorless cameras uh, extensively. I have used them uh, for sports and I love them uh, because uh, you can set up the new cameras so that they don't black out. In other words, uh, regular cameras, regular DSLR, you press the button, the mirror goes up, you lose view of your subject for a split second before the mirror goes down, but not on a mirrorless camera. You can keep it right in the center as you're trying to pan. Excellent for that application. Okay. All right. So, uh, I, and I was kind of talking to Jeff. So did you answer a, what is your camera? I use a Z6 and what was the question you had, Armando? Uh, just one second. What is your camera? And I use a Z6 and a uh, 12 to 800. Is that bad? I'm, I'm not sure. It says and 12,800. 12, I'm not sure what he's talking about there. Oh, okay. He's probably talking about the ISO. Uh, That's 12, what I'm saying. Uh, you know what? I do have the Z6. Uh, I have not done an ISO test on that camera, uh, but I believe it has a tweaked version of the uh, D750 sensor. So okay. I know that my D750 uh, tops off at 3200. I can't imagine that the Z6 is going to look uh, that much better at 12,800. So uh, it's really up to you. Again, that is an individual preference. Uh, your tolerance for noise and mine could be a little bit different. Okay. And that question was from Chris again. Uh, Chris also had another question. So I just messaged it to, uh, oh, no, that was from Jeff. Uh, sorry. Uh, Chris, had another, Chris Dillinger had another question. I, I uh, made a copy of it to you as well because it was like uh, a little bit long, but this is back to ISO question. I find it, I have to do a minus exposure compensation on 8,000 Kelvin so I can get white noise, so I can get around white noise. Is that okay to do since I will not go lower than uh, minus 1.7, but keep it as low as zero, minus 0 0.3 to minus 1.0. And do okay. not go over 10, 10K ISO sucks if you do. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Once again, uh, different cameras will perform differently at different ISO levels. And yes, once you go to a higher ISO, you might find that your whites might get a little bit dirty. A uh, little, maybe a little uh, color cast or something going on. So you may have to tweak that after the fact as well. So, okay. yeah, what, whatever it takes to uh, you know fix it. I okay. find that my camera, my Nikon's meter, run a little hot, so I always go minus one third right off the bat. Again, that's just my per personal preference. All right. Uh, uh, you had a question for Jeff about specials. Anything that's going uh, any, on? Any any deals going on, Jeff? Um, yeah, okay. but I don't have it memorized, so let me uh, <laughs> smaller my screen for a second, and then I'll answer. Absolutely. All right, no worries. Okay. 
All right. I, I tell you what, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to try. A, 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 there's only about 29 of us here. I'm going to unmute everybody. So if you all want to ask a question, that's great. Uh, then we'll do it that way. And so if you, everybody, we can talk, but try not try to talk over each other as far as that goes. It's going to be a little experiment. I haven't done it with this large of a group before, so let me try it out. So all participants are unmuted, so everyone can actually talk if they wish to. Or at least it should be kicking in. So that way, anybody else have any other questions for Mr. Amando? Uh, Amando, Amando, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Amando. Mr. Amando. Mr. Amando, sorry. Uh, so if anybody's got any questions, uh, you know, by all means, uh, give them a shout and ask them. I, it's a good time to pick someone's brain who's been out there doing it for quite a while. So, uh, yeah, when it comes to action, I am I am not what you call the pro from Dover. Dover. Uh, excuse me. This this is Jeff. What lens were we looking for on the um, special? No, no, just specials in general. Any deals um, going on? We do. We have okay. um, instant rebates on um, a lot of lenses right now. Um, for example, that you guys were talking about the 150 to 600 um, G2. And right now there's a $200 instant savings on that. So that brings it down to uh, from uh, 1399 down to 1199, which is pretty low for that particular lens. And um, <clears throat> that lens does perform by the way, much better than the Gen 1. Yeah. Um, also, on the 70 to 200 to 8 uh, from us, um, there's a $100 instant savings. On the 24 to 70 to 8, a $100 instant savings. And on the 15 to 30 2.8, there's a $100 instant savings. Now, here's the good one. On our 35 millimeter 1.4, that's the new you know, what they call the um, sharpest lens God ever made. Um, that one is, has a $200 instant savings as well. So that brings it from $899 down to $799. So I don't want to read you the whole thing because I don't think you'll, you'll uh, memorize it. But those are the key lenses, I think, for this particular conversation. If anybody has questions about any other ones. Um, <clears throat> oh, here's another one that's pretty aggressive. We have a... 70 to 210, um, and it's an F4. So it's a continuous F4 lens, it's full frame, and uh, it's regularly 799, and right now there's a $200 instant savings on it. So that's a very good value. And we also have a prime lens, which is a 45 millimeter 1.8. Super, super sharp lens, regularly 599, Two hundred dollar instant rebate, so that's down to three ninety nine. So those yeah. are all pretty aggressive prices. Yeah. And, and, and JPI carries most of these lenses, but you know, any anywhere you would get them, these these discounts would be there. Yeah, and keep in mind too, they've also just released uh, a bunch of uh, uh, prime lenses for the Sony FE mounts too that are out. So if you got some Sony mirrorless stuff, you can also check that stuff out as well. Don't forget about that. And, and those particular lenses are um, regularly 349 and they have a $50, um, currently a $50 instant rebate. So that brings them from 349 down to what, 299 Yeah, exactly. And for Sony shooters out there, when, you know, particularly with the Sony glass, they tend to be a little bit more expensive, obviously. And this is a great way to get a prime lens for a reasonable amount that's wickedly sharp and I think they've gotten a few points even over some of the Sony glass at that point but you know it's wicked stuff uh, you know this has been pretty cool we've had about uh, people from all the way from from Armando who uh, no, Armando Armando who's over in LA to we had somebody who wasn't from uh, Puerto Rico so we went from coast to coast basically <laughs> wow. from all this so I thought that was pretty cool uh, anybody else? Any have any other questions? Because I don't want to keep everyone on hold here. I, I mean, um, I have one on Canon. Yes. Question on uh, the lenses. I'm a uh, changed uh, from Canon to a Olympus four thirds right now. Okay. Are you looking at doing anything for the uh, micro four thirds lenses? Uh, used to shoot them with Canon, but uh, you know, don't see any availabilities now. 
Well, honestly, we've made one lens for Micro Four Thirds. That lens has been in existence for maybe seven years now, I think. Uh, it's a 14 to 150, uh, which with the crop factor, it converts to a 28 to 300. Um, that's all we have. That's all we've had. So I don't know if we will keep making or we will make any more in that range. I mean, for that, you know, four third system. But who knows? And I've talked to a few people that own that lens who've been very happy with it. And um, it's the price right now is um, pretty good. It's three ninety nine. Yeah. So it's a great walk around lens, you know, you want to go out and shoot, but you don't want to carry three or four. That's probably one that I would use. Uh, Let's call it an all in one lens, you know. Yep. <laughs> That's what I always enjoyed the, uh, the Tamron lenses for a walk around when I was traveling uh, with my Canon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I got another question from Chris because he does have a mic. He, uh, so he's, he's asking, uh, any news of uh, making lenses for Nikon mirrorless bodies, the Z lenses? You know, they, they are looking at it. Um, they told us they're looking at it, but we don't have uh, any time frame at this point. Right. So I hope they do. I mean, I've got a Z and uh, it's, it's a viable system. So yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I would say that that is on the radar, but they're very um, closed mouth about prelim, you know, giving out information before we're, we're certain what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. And, um, but uh, I would say because they provided the Z6 and um, <clears throat> they will be providing also with um, Canon R's to those of us, you know, who are out in the field um, to use. And so I think that is an indication that, that all that stuff is on the radar. Yeah. But time, who knows, especially right now, factories are all, you know, in, in a weird position right now and everything else. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, who knows what's gonna happen or when. Yeah, I think that answered Glidden's question. He had, and he says, are there any plans for the RF mount? So I think we yes. got that one. Yeah, yeah same one. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were told yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Any, anything else, guys, and, you know, the, out there? Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then, um, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, don't forget, uh, in two weeks, uh, Ken Hubbard's going to be doing his uh, Mysteries of Night Photography. Uh, so that's going to be pretty good. Is uh, that's going to be? I'm excited about that one as well. I mean, I'm sure it'll be very, very well attended. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough for making the time and making the effort to come out uh, tonight. Well, come out. I keep saying come out. <laughs> I, I'm here. I, I'm here at a pantsless webinar. I'm like yeah, 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 yeah. So no, no. Uh, anyway, so uh, I can't thank you enough for 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 joining us here uh, on the webinar, and I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to uh, go to Johnson Photo Imaging. I'll be, like I said, I'll be sharing the link uh, through the newsletter. And you know, if you guys are okay, I'll probably even post it onto the uh, uh, the In Focus page. I'll figure out how to do that there as well too. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And I can't thank Jeff and and of course Ar Armando for very much for taking the time and sitting down and talking with us and going over some of those tips and hints from Tamron. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. No, Thanks, this is a great uh, distraction. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Support your local dealers. Yeah, exactly. As I said, Mike, Michael Arbor, the general manager, he is there at the store from 10 to two Monday through Saturday, he says, uh, but definitely give him a call at the store during those time frames. He will be there and uh, uh, he'll uh, try to answer your questions there at the store. Obviously, if you guys need to get a hold of me, you can also do it through Facebook, you know, you, or and my own email if you want to get a hold of that as well, too. Uh, there's plenty of contact info in there. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for all the thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I look forward to the next webinar with, with you, Jeff, and, and, when, and with Ken as well when, we, when I get to meet him. All right. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, Ramondo. Any, anything? All right. Thanks. I'm going to click on end meeting and stop the recording. Okay. Right, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, it's good for me to be here.